All right, so they're in Psalm 28, verse 1. Psalm 28, verse number 1, it begins by saying, Unto thee will I cry. And so that's what I decided to title the sermon this evening. Unto thee will I cry. Now, of course, this is King David speaking to the Lord God. And we know that he's a man of prayer. And uh, our, you know, Pastor Stevenson preached a great sermon last week, last Wednesday, on the topic of prayer. So we are going to be looking at prayer once again. Uh, thank you, brother. Uh, but again, you know, uh, we are starting just here in, in Psalm 28 because I'm back in the book of Psalms. We are going to spend the next three weeks in Psalms. So I'll be going through 28, 29, and 30. And then I'll begin preaching uh, on a new book of the Bible for this church, okay? But as you guys know, between books, we often just take three Psalms, break it up uh, this way. And so we're up to Psalm 28. And again, the title for the sermon this evening is Unto Thee Will I Cry. So what is it that King David is crying unto the Lord? Now remember... You know, this is, this is a little bit different to just, just praying. We all pray. You know, Brother Emmanuel just prayed now before the, before the preaching, right? But no one was really crying out. You know, to cry out is to lift your voice. You know, some, you know usually you, you may cry when you're in a period of anguish or, you know, deep sorrow and, and, and you're, you're desperate and, and you need an answer and you need help and, and you feel like the whole world is, is, is falling apart around you. Hey, that is the point that we need to cry. Now, brethren, I don't know how often you've cried unto the Lord. I'm not talking about shedding tears. I'm saying you've literally found a secret place, lifted up your voice, and just with all your might, asked the Lord to answer some prayer. You know, I thank God that we live in a relatively peaceful country, you know, where we can uh, worship God in freedom, with the freedoms that we currently have. Yeah, they're being tested. They're being slowly being taken away from us. But by and large, compared to the rest of the world here in Australia, we are very, uh, very free. We, we, we are, you know, it, it's, life in Australia is very easy. You know, and again, you say, well, I'm going through hardships. I'm just saying compared to the, some other places in this world. You know, Australia is a, a good country to live in, very uh, easy country to live in. And so we don't often have these situations where we just need to lift up our voices and cry. But, you know, this is something the Lord wants to hear from us from time to time. You know, we still go through some level of difficulties. And, of course, uh, uh, you know, we, we know that David uh, suffered many times. You know, he had many enemies around him. He had many threats to his life. And so I can see by King David, you know, uh, in his example, that he had times where he needed to lift up his voice. But look what he says after that. He says, I cry, O Lord, my rock. And then he says, be not silent to me. Be not silent to me. Isn't that what we want when we go to the Lord in prayer? We don't want him to be silent. We want him to hear our prayer. We want him, we want him to hear our request and we want him to answer the request. Okay, so uh, David saying, look, just don't be silent to me. Why does he say these words? And I think it's really interesting here. It says, if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down into the pit. I thought this was a really interesting part of this psalm. Okay, so we learn something here that for people that go into the pit, God is silent to them. Okay, now, what pit is this speaking about? You know, if we fall into a hole, Let's say someone digs a hole, we don't watch our step, we fall into that hole, say, and we can't get out. Say, Lord, can you help us? Is God going to be silent in that pit? Is, is, that what, is that the pit that's been referred to here? Keep your finger there and go to Numbers 16, please. Numbers 16 and verse number 28. Numbers 16 and verse number 28. And again, you know, we need to understand that, you know, it, it's, it's good to take the Bible literally. You know, but if you take the Bible too literally, you will read that and you think, if I fall into a hole... God's not going to answer my prayers or something like that, right? I mean, we, we know that uh, Joseph, for example, was thrown into a pit by his brothers. Does that mean God remained silent to Joseph? No, we, we know that God had great plans to Joseph. And so we're speaking about a different pit here. Numbers chapter 16 and verse number 28. And we're looking at the rebellion of Korah, okay? Numbers 16 verse number 28. They uh, desired, to, desired to take uh, positions like Moses. They weren't happy that there was this just one man, Moses, that was ruling over the people of Israel. And, and Korah, with his people, they wanted to rise up and, and be leaders as well, even though it was not the Lord's direction at this point in time. Look at verse number 28. And Moses said, Hereby you shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of, mine own, um, of my own mind. If these men, that's Korah and his rebellion, die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth, and swallow them with all that appertaineth, appertain unto them, and look at this, and they go down quick into the pit. 
Then you shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses and all the men that appertained unto Korah and all their goods. They and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit and the earth closed upon them and they perished from among the congregation. So what do we learn here? We learn that these, re this re these rebellious people, very clearly unsaved, Okay, never have this impression as you read for your Old Testament that every, every person in the nation was saved. That's not true. They were all people of God. They were all people of God under the Old Covenant. But just because you're in the Old Covenant it doesn't mean you're saved. Because if they don't trust Christ, if they don't put their faith on, 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 on Jehovah as they knew Him at this point in time, they would not be saved. Even they might go and, and do the, uh, the rituals and do the sacrifices, but if their faith was not on the Lord alone for salvation, these are not saved people. Okay, uh, just because they are labeled the people of God, it's under the old covenant. Thank God for the new covenant, even better. Anybody that's in the new covenant is guaranteed saved. You can only enter the new covenant by being saved. Okay, but anyway, the point being here, these guys descended into a pit. The earth opened up, they descended alive. This was the judgment and the punishment that they would experience from the Lord. Now, you might say, well, what is that referring to? Well, I strongly believe that's hell. I strongly believe that's hell. Okay, now can you please go to Revelation chapter 20 for me, please? Revelation chapter 20, verse number 1. Because I, I do want to show you not just one passage, but I want to show you a couple of passages where we see this pit in the earth. And if you know your Bibles, I don't have time to go through all this. You know, it's very clear in the Bible that what we know as hell, in you know, that place of fire and torment, is somewhere under the earth. Okay, in, in the center of the earth, and hell has enlarged itself. And that's where the souls of men that have not believed on Christ, that have rejected Christ, this is where they go down into that pit. But in Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 1, we're now looking forward to a, we're looking at a future event to come. And we know that one day Christ will return. Praise God. Can't wait for that, brethren. I can't wait. You know, every day, it's, when I was a kid, I, you know, I'll tell you the truth. When I was a kid, I was like, oh, Jesus, don't come back yet. Right? Because I haven't really lived my life yet. You know, I kind of want to have a job and kind of want to experience life and get married and have my own family. But now that I've, you know, now I'm just like, Lord, I'm just in the wickedness of this world. I'm like, Lord, just come back. <laughs> just come back. You know, I can't wait for you to come back, Lord. I can't wait to have a righteous government. And we know that Christ is coming back and he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. And then it says here in Revelation chapter 20 and verse number one, and this is at the beginning of that thousand year reign. It says in verse number one, and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. So you can see another pit here referred to. Well, I believe it's the same pit actually, but it's quite an interesting pit. It's not just a hole in the ground. This is something that is bottomless. Okay. The idea of a bottomless pit is something that you cannot get out of. Okay. When you fall in the pit, you just keep falling. You can't fall upwards basically. And I don't know if this has something to do with the gravitational pull, uh, you know, that, that, that in the earth, I have no idea. And maybe it has that sensation that you just keep falling, that's possible. Or it just might be, might be more, more uh, uh, symbolic of the idea that it's just a pit that you'll never get out of, okay? Now, that bottomless pit, you see here that this angel has the, the chain in his hand. Look at verse number two. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. Something else that we learn in the book of Revelation, that out of this pit came out these locusts from hell, basically, that are tormenting uh, the people that have taken the mark of the beast. So, the point being, brethren, is this. We see that in the Bible, yes, pit can often refer to just a hole in the ground, okay? But what we see here that the pit can also refer to hell, okay? This place in this earth, okay? Something supernatural, something uh, where, where you can literally be sent to, you know, where the Lord can actually send you body and soul into hell. That's what happened to Korah. And so when we look back at Psalm 28 and verse number one, it says, I became like them that go into the pit. And it says about them, be not silent to me, lest uh, if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go into the pit. We learn something interesting about hell. That in hell, people are calling out to God and God is being silent to them. I mean, I, I know hell is a terrible place. 
I know it's a place of fire and torment and you've got the worms of hell tormenting you and uh, you'll never get out of that. And even when you are free for a t- temporary period of time, you're cast into the second death, which is the lake of fire. Uh, it's horrible. Hell is a horrible place. But something else that we learn here is that people are calling out to God and God is completely silent unto them. Okay, now, I don't, you know, Lord, help me. I, I don't know what they're saying. You know, here's the thing, though. You know, the, what if they believe on Jesus while they're in hell? Well, at that point, they're reprobate. And we know that reprobates can't believe anyway. Okay, so, I mean, they might be asking, God, get me out of here. But look, the last thing they're going to do is put their faith on Jesus Christ. It's, 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 that opportunity has been gone. That opportunity is gone. But I, I thought it was quite interesting that, you know, God will be silent. Now, we know that the fires of hell are lit by the anger of God. We know those fires proceed out of Jesus Christ, out of the Lamb of God. So God is present in hell. I'm not saying that God is not present. All I'm saying is these people are yelling out to God and He's just silent. He doesn't answer them. He doesn't satisfy them with a single answer. And so what we learn here, you know, and, and I am, again, preaching about prayer here, is, you know, hell is a place where God is silent, where God is silent. So I want to be like David here, where, you know, God, I don't want you to be silent with me. I want to hear from you, Lord. I want to hear what you have to say to me because I don't want to suffer on this earth a little bit of hell. I I don't want that. You know, if God is not speaking to you, if God is not answering prayers, if God is completely silent to you, you know what? That's a taste of what hell is like. And none of us want to experience that. Okay? This is a, a, a bad thing. And so, you know, when we don't pray to the Lord, we're actually, you know, when we don't go to Him with our requests and supplications, when we, we just give that, that, that up in our lives, you're basically saying, Lord, I want to experience hell a little bit. I want to know what it's like to not be in communication with you. Okay, so prayer is important, okay? It actually differentiates a, a significant part of what hell is like. Look at verse number two uh, in Psalm 28. Psalm 28, verse number two. It says, Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry unto thee, when I lift up my hands toward thy holy oracle. So you can see the desperation of, of David here, wanting the Lord to hear his cries. You know, wanting the Lord to not be silent to his requests. So why live a life that resembles hell? Why live a life where you stop praying and stop going to the Lord? Why would you want that? Okay? I, I don't want to experience hell on this earth, even if it's just the silence of God. I don't want to experience that, okay? There's a desperation that's coming from David in this psalm here. And so, you know, how do we hear from God? Well, the easiest way, the quickest way, is just open up your Bible. That is the Word of God. Those are the words that God wants you to listen to, to learn from, to walk thereby. That's the easiest way to hear from God. But guess what? If you don't pick up your Bible and read it, it just collects dust on the bookshelf or something, you're experiencing a taste of hell right there. Why would you want that in your life? You know? Why would you want that? Again, not petitioning God for answered prayer, not going to the Lord for help, you're just asking God, give me a taste of hell. You know, Lord, I want, to, I, want to be, I want you to be silent with me when you don't listen to God's word. Now, notice there in verse number two, he said that he lifts up his hands toward thy holy oracle. Thy holy oracle. Now, oracle comes from the word, you know, it has the same sort of base words as the word oral. Something that's coming out of your mouth, okay? Now, what I want you to uh, think about what the horror, what I'm not sure what you think the Holy Oracle is, but let's find out. If you can keep your finger there and go to 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8. I thought this was quite interesting here. 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse number 5. 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse number 5. And we're going to be looking at the temple here, Solomon's temple. Now keep in mind that when we read Psalm 28, that's David's psalm. So this is before Solomon, his son, built a temple, obviously. Okay? But I believe the, holy, the oracle here is the same thing. It's just, obviously, the tabernacle was something that could be transported around, whereas the temple was a fixed structure. Those were the two major changes between the house of God there. But in 1 Kings chapter 8, and verse number 5, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse number 5, it says, And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him, were with him before the ark. So we, we got the ark of the covenant mentioned here. Sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be told nor numbered for multitude. Now notice this. And the priests brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto his place 
What place? What is the place that the Ark of the Covenant is going to be put into? It says there, into the oracle of the house, to the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubims. So we learn what the, what the holy oracle there is. Okay, It's the most holy place. It's the place that the Ark of the Covenant would be situated in. And if you know how they did things, you know, once a year, the great high priest would go into, or the, the great high priest, the high priest, I should say. Jesus Christ is the great high priest. Anyway, the high priest would go into that most holy, the holy of holies, and he would go there and sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice uh, onto that, the, the, the mercy seat there on the Ark of the Covenant. And so that's where it was situated. And, and if you may also remember, a very uh, popular part of that area was that it was covered by a thick veil. You know, that, that veil, when, when Christ died on the cross, the veil was torn into two, and it opened up to the, you know, access to the most holy place uh, to anybody, basically, okay? Because originally, it was a place that was just for the high priest. Now, can you please turn to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 20? So what we learn here in the psalm, in Psalm 28, is as David's crying unto the Lord, he says he lifts up his hand towards thy holy oracle. And so he's, he's, positioning, he's positioning himself toward the temple of God you know, and focusing his prayers toward that most holy place. Okay? And the reason it was so holy is because God's presence was there. Okay? David's not praying to some object. Okay? The Ark of the Covenant is not the object of his prayers. It's not the, the room that the Ark of the Covenant was situated. He was praying to the presence of God, to God himself. Okay? Now, if we look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 20, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 20, it says, By a new and living way, which he have consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God. Speaking about Jesus Christ. And so that veil in the most holy place represented the flesh of Christ. And so when Christ's flesh died, when he was broken for us, it pictured that veil being torn. Into, in fact, the, the, the veil was torn into pictured the flesh of Christ. That was the, the symbolism. That, that veil was the type. Okay? And you can see here that the Lord has done that for us. And now in verse number 21, we have a high priest over the house of God. That high priest is not some Levitical priest. That high priest, of course, is Jesus Christ after the order of Melchizedek. Now, please go to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse number 25. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse number 25. It says, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, that's by Jesus, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. I thought this was amazing. Because what do we learn here? That the Lord Jesus Christ forever, well, at least till we go home and to be with, in heaven with the Lord, right? Is interceding on our behalf. Inter constantly. His blood constantly intercedes on our behalf. You know, anytime we sin and the devil, our accuser, okay, runs to the Lord God, and I don't know if this is how it works, but I guess it works to some extent, okay, and says, you know, uh, Pastor Kevin sinned again. You know what? Jesus Christ there? No? My blood intercedes, okay? It's been taken care of. It got taken care of 2,000 years ago, okay? And this is why we, we have the surety of heaven. Or another reason why we have the surety of heaven is because no matter what accusations, no matter what, what sin we, we may be accused of, of, of doing, Jesus Christ there is interceding on our behalf, okay? Because his flesh represents that veil to the most holy place, that place being the oracle of God. Okay, And I thought this was amazing because we see David praying to this area that had the presence of God, that had the oracle of God, and who is it that answers our prayers? You know, when we pray, Jesus Christ says to pray in His name. Yes, we're instructed to pray to the Father, but He says to ask all things in His name. So we too have this access to pray to the oracle, this place that is the most holy, but it's been made accessible to us by the sacrifice of Christ. So when we think about that, I, I kind of want to pray more. <laughs> I don't know about you, but you know what? That place was very special. Only the high priest can enter. Now we can enter. All of us can enter every time we pray unto the Lord. Back to Psalm 28 and verse number 3. Psalm 28 and verse number 3. David says, Draw me not away with the wicked, nor with the workers of iniquity, 
which speak peace to to their neighbours, but mischief is in their hearts. All right. So David knows that God will judge the wicked. Okay. And uh, well, the wicked here. Let's have a look. What are the wicked? What are the workers of iniquity doing? They they speak peace to the neighbours. They you know yeah they get along with the neighbours, but mischief is in their hearts. They're backstabbers. They actually want to cause harm to their neighbours. Okay, they portray themselves one way and they want to harm, they want to hurt their fellow neighbours. Those are the wicked, wicked people okay, that, that David is speaking about here. And he says that he doesn't want to be drawn away with the wicked. Okay? So when God comes to judge the workers of iniquity, David does not want that same judgment upon him. The idea there is, you know, the drawing, drawing away is kind of the idea of, of going fishing. And some, some fishermen have a draw net. Right? They, they put a net out there. And then as time goes, whatever time that is, they draw that net in and they catch a lot of fish. Obviously, they catch a lot of stuff, but they also catch a lot of stuff that they weren't really intending. It might be just garbage that's in the ocean. It might be other sea life that is not profitable to them. Okay, so when you draw, it, you know, you're, you're drawing whatever is in that area, whatever is in that, you know, uh, within that net, whatever has been caught in that net, even though it wasn't what you intended to draw in the first place. Well, that's the kind of idea that we have here with, with David. You know, he, he lives in a wicked world. He, he has wicked people around him. And he knows that God's judgment is going to fall upon the wicked. And he says, but oh man, I, I'm right here. Right? And he's asking, Lord, please don't, uh, uh, don't, don't cause me harm when you decide to judge the wicked. I don't want to be countered toward that judgment that you do toward the wicked. I think that's a, that's a good prayer to have. But one thing that we learn here is that many times when God does judge, you know, he might judge a wicked nation. God's people, even those people that are walking righteously, living righteously, are still affected by that judgment. You know, down in Sydney, I'm going through the Jeremiah series, and we know that God's judgment fell upon Judah, and, uh, and they were taken into captivity by the Babylonians. But remind yourself, it wasn't just the wicked. It wasn't just the unsaved Jews that got taken away. Even righteous people were affected by the judgment, Okay. And yeah, you know what? Many of those fared well. In fact, Jeremiah fared really well. He was actually let go free. But we still have stories of great men like Daniel and his three friends. Like, um, uh, who's the other person I'm thinking about? Ezekiel. Ezekiel, yeah. Ezekiel as well. We have other great men of God that were, unfortunately, you know, they're serving God. But because God's uh, wrath fell, God's judgment fell, they too were caught up in that judgment. Hey, but ultimately, things fared well for them as well. Okay. But you can see that with David, he realizes, you know, when God's judgment falls on the wicked, it can be the case where God's people are caught up with the consequences of that judgment, okay? Now, can you please keep your finger there and go to Genesis 18? Go to Genesis 18. I think this is a good cry, a good prayer to have unto the Lord, that he would not draw us away with the wicked that he would give us a way of escape from any kind of negative consequences of his judgment. But in Genesis 18, verse number 23, I like this story, very famous story. We know about uh, the Lord destroying Sodom and Gomorrah for their filthiness, for their wickedness. I don't want to go into that right now. I just want you to think about Lot, because we think about how, how Lot was uh, delivered from that judgment. You know, we often think about that, right? That uh, God would see fit to send his two angels to pull Lot out of that fire, and, uh, you know, that's a picture of our rapture. You know, that before God's wrath, before God pours out His wrath on this world, that He will send His angels uh, to collect His saints from the earth so they will, will not fall in the judgment of God. But what we read here in Genesis 18, verse number 23, Abraham, God having told Abraham what He would do to Sodom and Gomorrah, verse number 23, it says, And Abraham drew near and said, Will thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Because, yeah, that's a good question. Lord, are you going to destroy a whole city? What about the righteous? He's thinking about Lot, of course. Lot got saved. It doesn't seem like it, but he was just Lot. Okay? He, was, he was a saved person, and he's on his way to heaven. I don't think his rewards are much in heaven, but okay, he got there at the end. <laughs> Praise God. But that's a good question to ask. You know, Abra- Abraham realizes, the Lord, if you judge the way you're going to judge, there are going to be some righteous caught up in this judgment. Look at verse number 24. Per adventure, there'll be 50 righteous within the city, Will thou also destroy and not spare the place for the 50 righteous that, uh, that are therein? That, sorry, that be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee, 
shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So what we have is Abraham praying, well, he's speaking to the Lord, but the same concept, right? Prayer is speaking to the Lord, asking the same thing, asking the same thing that David is asking, right? You don't want to be drawn away with the wicked when God's judgment comes. That's not right, right? But then look at verse 26. And the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. And Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I have taken un upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Peradventure, there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Will thou destroy all the city for lack of five? And he said, If I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. So Abraham's thinking, Oh man, I don't think we're going to find fifty safe people in that city. Maybe forty-five. And then he thinks, Oh, you know what? I think I'm being too generous there. I don't think there's forty-five righteous people. Listen. Praise God for our church. You know, we may not be a, a very big church, okay? But when we're all here, when all the families that are part of this church, you know, when we had our church anniversary and, and we, everyone turned up that, uh, you know, sees this church as their church, we're more than 50, okay? We're more... We're, but Sunshine Coast is faring better than Sodom at this point in time, okay? <laughs> so I, I don't know how much of God's wrath we're holding back. Hey, but we're playing a part, praise God. We're playing a part, praise you know, and, and you know, we get out there, we see souls saved, and you know, and I know there weren't many souls saved on the Soul Winning Meg Marathon up here, but there were two. Praise God for the two, okay? I mean, that might be holding God's judgment back a little further, just two more there, right? I mean, you know, we can see here that uh, Abraham and God, they're working on singular numbers here, right? Just, just five short, you know, praise God for the two that got saved. Anyway, let's keep going. Verse number uh, 30. Sorry, verse number 29. And he, and he spake unto me yet again and said, Peradventure, there shall, be 40, there shall be 40 found there. And he said, I will not do it for 40's sake. And he said unto him, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Peradventure, there shall 30 be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And he said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure, there shall be 20 found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but this once. Peradventure, ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left commun communion with Abraham, and Abraham returned unto his place. So God says, you know what, if there's just ten, I, I, I won't destroy that city. And we know that city was wicked. We know that city deserves the fiery judgments that came from heaven, okay? But God says, you know what, just 10, and I would save that city. We know Lot and his family are there. That makes up a big part of that 10. That tells us that Lot was not preaching the gospel, that Lot was doing no effort to proclaim the God of Abraham to the people there. If each member of his family just got one more person saved, that whole city would have remained. Now, God does a wonderful miracle. We know the story. He pulls Lot out with his wife and his daughters, even though his wife perishes because she looks back. But I want you to just think about it from the flip side there. We often look at that story. Thank God he stepped in and pulled out Lot, you know, saved his life. But notice when God's judgment came, even the righteous, even just Lot was affected. He lost his city. He lost his house. He lost his daughters that were married, that remained in the city. Okay? He ended up losing his wife. I mean, he lost, if I lost those things, if I lost all those, I lost my wife, I lost my kids to some extent, that would crush me, okay? But that judgment was falling upon the wicked, okay? And so we need to realize that, you know, when, when God's, you know, we, we don't want to be too associated with a wicked world. We don't want to be too associated with wicked friends and, and wicked family members, right? I, I know you can't escape it. We all have to live our lives. And I'm not trying to, be, trying to tell you be a recluse and find some property out in the middle of nowhere and live out your life like that. But we don't want to be so attached where if God's judgment were to fall upon the wicked, that we would be affected. You know, the more attached you are to a wicked world, the greater the consequences may be upon you when God judges the wicked. So it is a, it is a good thing to be praying for that the Lord would not draw us away with the wicked, with the workers of the iniquity. Now, something else I wanted to mention here in, in uh, Psalm 28, look at verse number 3 again. So the workers of iniquity that are mentioned in this psalm are those which speak peace to their neighbors, but mischief is in their hearts. Now, I want to differentiate this with how we are commanded to live our lives. Because you know what? We're commanded also to speak peace with our neighbors. 
Okay, I'll just read the passage to you in Romans 12, 17. It says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Hey, brethren, that's a commandment. That's something we're called to do. If it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. I hope you're seeking to live that way. I, I want peace. You know, I, want, I want peace with my neighbours. I, I want peace with my community. I, that, I want that. Okay, because we're commanded to, to have that, right? I want my, my kids to live in a peaceful country. I want them to be able to worship God in peace and freedom. Okay, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with, with doing the best you can to just live peaceably, even with those that you know are wicked in this world. Okay, but what these people are doing, not only are they speaking peace to their neighbours, but they have mischief in their hearts. Their desire is to hurt people. Okay, again, the backstabber. You know, backstabbing people are the worst. They're workers of iniquity. And yes, even Christians can be backstabbers. Even God's people can be backstabbers. You know, if someone speaks peaceably to me and behind my back, they're just stabbing me in the back. I, I don't want anything to do with that person. I don't want to be drawn away when God decides to judge these wicked people. It's like, I, I want nothing to do with that. Look, I, I'm all for peace, but I'm not there to just destroy people's lives. You know, speak kindly to them and destroy them. Now, look, if God's judgment falls upon them, so be it. That's God's business. Okay, we were told, recompense to no man evil for evil. So even if these people do evil to me, you know what? I'm commanded to just do the best I can with all I have to just get along with that person and live peaceably with them. Okay, so don't confuse what we're commanded to do with what these wicked people are doing in Psalm 28. Look at verse number four. It says, give them according to their deeds and according to the wickedness of their endeavors. Give them after the work of their hands, render to them their deserts. All right, so what is David praying for? God, judge the wicked. Give them what they deserve, Lord, right? They've got endeavors. What's an endeavor? It's something that you sort of strive to accomplish. You have a goal, you have a plan. These people are striving to accomplish wickedness. And it's right for us to pray to our holy God and say, God, can you judge them swiftly? Can you take down these wicked people? What else do we learn about wickedness? Well, who are these people? It says, oh, give them after the work of, sorry, give, yeah, give them after the work of their hands. It says, render to them their deserts. Now, when we look at that word desert there, oh, it's not, not, not desert, desert, it doesn't mean desert like we think about it. When we think, read the word desert, we think of, you know, a, uh, a wilderness, forsaken, barren wilderness, you know, maybe a sandy desert or something like that. That's not what we're speaking about here. The word desert here has the same sort of thought as the word deserve. So when it says there, render to them their desert, it's basically saying render to them what they deserve, what they have done to hurt people. Lord, you hurt them in the same way, right? An eye for an eye kind of idea, right? Look at verse number five. Because what is it that they're doing, these wicked people? Because they regard not the works of the Lord, nor the operation of his hands, he shall destroy them and not build them up. So what else is extremely wicked according to the Bible? People that do not acknowledge or regard the works of God. Uh, it, it, big bang. You know, we're all here because of the big bang. You know, we're all here because two monkeys decided to shave I don't know. Aren't we shaving monkeys? Is that what you know, and uh, you know, we were. We started as a single bacteria that came out of the ocean. You know, that became a frog, and they don't regard the works of God. That's wickedness. Evolution is wicked. Okay, atheism is wicked. Being able to look at God's creation, and say, "Well, no, it wasn't God." I mean, that is extreme. That, that's extreme. You know, athe I know there's a lot of atheists in this world. Okay, you can just understand they're very wicked. That <laughs> they're very wicked, okay, because they deny the works of God's hands. It says, He shall destroy them and not build them up. You know, something that, that's wonderful as well with the Bible, sometimes we read, we, we read these things, and then we can also understand that the, kind of the reverse is also true. So if God will not build them up because they don't acknowledge the works of His hands, well, here's one way that you can be built up by God, by acknowledging God's creation by acknowledging that God is the creator, that he's the Lord of this earth, okay? This is my father's world, right? And if we acknowledge God, the promise here, well, if we do that, we, we acknowledge and, and, and honor the works of his hands that he will build us up, 
He will lift us up in the times of difficulties and times of, of troubles. That's easy. I find it very easy to acknowledge God. Say, God, thank you for creation. God, thank you for my children. Thank you for blessing me with the fruit of the womb. Hey, if we acknowledge that, God says that he will build us up. And I like what David says in verse number six. Blessed be the Lord, because he have heard the voice of my supplications. That's kind of like, you know, verse number two, number two said, hear the voice of my supplications. Well, verse number, eight, number six, yep, because you have heard the voice of my supplications. So what else can we learn here? We need to just understand that when we do pray, the Lord hears. The Lord hears. I mean, just, 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 const, just think about that, right? The God of the universe, the creator of all things, okay? He's creating, one day creating new heaven and new earth. He's promised us heaven, streets of gold and the mansions, forgiveness of sins. He's made us his children, kings and priests, ambassadors and, and soldiers, and he's given us the Holy Spirit. He's given us the power to preach the gospel and see people. That same God that we read about that can do amazing supernatural miracles is the same God that can hear you when you pray to him. That's a, it's the same God. You know, sometimes we read the amazing stories of the Old Testament. Boy, how God stepped in and destroyed Egypt or destroyed Sodom, Gomorrah. You know, well, it's the same God that we pray to, you know. And I, I just love the fact that when we pray, we ought to pray knowing that God is listening. You know, sometimes prayer can sort of, again, become mundane. Thank you, Lord, for the food. Please bless it to my body. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, oh, Lord, thank you for church. Please bless us. You know, sometimes we can get into this. And again, we, we, don't, wanna, we don't want to get into that practice of just vain repetitions, we, we need to acknowledge and understand that God is hearing what we have to say. And, and you know, it, it's just like you're talking to somebody, you know, they're not going to want to hear the same things repeated over and over again. And look, I'm at fault as much as anybody else. I know my prayers can sometimes be repetitive. Uh, you know what? But we need to just remember that this is a powerful being, the most powerful of all beings, okay? And he wants to interact with us. He wants to hear our supplications. He does not want to be silent. He does not want to be silent. And I, I love it when the Lord answers prayers. I, I, I love it when it's just a clear response to a prayer. And I'm just thinking, Lord, how, how is it, Lord? Because I know I'm a sinner. I know I stuff up all the time, Lord. How is it that you can hear me, Lord, and answer this like you just have? You know? And, and it's, the, it's the confidence, it's the faith that David has. And we ought to have as well, knowing that God not just hears, but he answers our prayers. Look at verse number seven. So verse number six basically ends that portion of the psalm where he's actually praying. And then he kind of has like a little summary, the last three verses of this psalm. He says in verse number seven, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am helped. Therefore my heart greatly rejoiceth and with my song will I praise him. You can see where David gets his strength. He gets his strength, not just his strength to fight, but he's also his, his strength of protection, the shield, it comes from the Lord. You know, this is something that David has with the Lord, this close walk, this close fellowship, uh, this, this union with the Lord, and his heart is completely trusting that the Lord will help him in a time of difficulty. I love how David rejoices. I will greatly rejoice, and with my song I will praise him. Don't forget, church is a great time to sing praises to God. You know, sing those hymns. You know, praise the Lord when you sing those hymns. And I, I like it because verse number seven, he's speaking about himself. You know, the Lord is my strength. And then he says in verse number eight, uh, sorry, yeah, verse number eight, he, he, uh, he looks at the greater populace of Israel. Or for us, we might look at, you know, yes, the Lord is my strength, he's my shield. And then we might look at the greater, uh, the general assembly of the church. Everybody else, in verse number 8, it says, The Lord is their strength, and he is the saving strength of his anointed. So, I like that because not only does he personally have this strong walk with God, he's able to look at others and say, well, the Lord is their strength as well. That's what I would like for our church. I would like uh, not just for myself, the pastor, to have strength in the Lord, but I would love for the whole congregation to be strong people of the Lord, strong families. You know, my, my, one of my old pastors would say that a strong church 
requires strong families. It's so true. It's so true. You know, there's, there's that common saying, you know, you're only as strong as your weakest link. That's true as well. You know, and, and so my desire, it's, uh, it's not about like, oh, who's the weakest in the church? You know, <laughs> who's letting us down from not accomplishing some greater thing? It's not that. Okay, and we're all weak to some extent. You know, God's church is ought to be a place where we come to uh, seek His strength, to, to seek protection, to be built up by His word, to be reminded of the most basic. This is a basic thing. This psalm is not, there's nothing really amazing here in this psalm, you know, that's, that will blow you out of the water that you don't already know. But, you know, praying, we need, it's something we just need to be reminded of because prayer has power, great power, to change the direction of this world when we petition our Lord. I want you to be able to acknowledge and say to yourself, the Lord is my strength. That's what I want. I want individuals to be strong with the Lord. I want families to be strong, walking with the Lord. And the stronger we are, the stronger New Life Baptist Church will be. The, the greater works that we'll be able to accomplish for God. But it begins looking at ourselves. Are we walking with the Lord? And then the greater numbers, right? If we're fathers, if, we're, if you know, we have a family, then we ought to be looking at that for our family. Yes, I'm walking with the Lord. I've got strength in the Lord. But does my wife, do my children, are they walking with the Lord? Now, another thing that we notice here in verse number 8 that I want to draw your attention to, it says the Lord is their strength. And then it says, and he is the saving strength of his anointed. The saving strength of his anointed. Now, David might be referring to himself again in this passage, like the anointed bit, because he was anointed. David, you know, the, the anointing is the idea of a bit of oil being put upon you. He was anointed to the position as the king of Israel. Uh, but if you go back to the Hebrew, yes, I went, I went back to the Hebrew. Okay. If you go back to the Hebrew, the word anointed there um, is the word Mashiach. Okay, Mashiach, which is where we get the word Messiah from okay and often you know when we think about messiah we think of course of christ because christ is the translation of the word messiah so what i want to do um very quickly is just turn to first samuel 26 first samuel 26 so i'm not telling you exactly who the anointed here is it might be david it might be david it might be the lord jesus christ okay but look at first samuel 26 and verse number seven i just want to show you something here first samuel 26 and verse number seven because, you know, the reason I'm going for this, again, this might not even seem like part of the sermon, but I like to educate as well. Not just preach, but I like to educate people in the Bible. Because I, I learn things sometimes, and I see the errors of people sometimes when they, when they preach things and they, get, they go back to the Hebrew. Oh, do you know this word Mashiach means Messiah, and therefore this is about Christ? It could be sometimes. Okay? But I want you to notice here in, in 1 Samuel 26, verse number 7. So David and Abishai came to the people by night, and behold, Saul lay sleeping within the trench. That's King Saul. And his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster. But Abner and the people lay round about him. Then said Abishai to David, God have delivered thine enemy into thine hand this day. Now therefore let him smite him, I pray thee, with a spear, even to the earth at once, and I will not smite him the second time. And so David has this opportunity you know, he's being persecuted by King Saul. David has the opportunity to go and kill Saul. Okay, and this is how David responds in verse number 9. <coughs> and David said to Abishai, Destroy him not, for who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guilt guiltless? Well, you know what? If you go back to the Hebrew, the, the word there for the Lord's anointed is Mashiach. Again, where we get the word Messiah from. Now, obviously... Soul is not Christ, okay? But just something I just want you to think about as you, you know, study your Bible and you gain more knowledge, you know, because I'm telling you, I see these things happen in churches. I see these things happen with preachers. Ah, oh, Mashiach, Mish, whatever, what is it? Mashiach, that's Messiah. That's, that's got to be about Jesus. Well, is Mashiach here? It's about King Saul. I mean, he, at this point, he's a, an extremely wicked king. Okay, so the point being is that, you know, just because we go back to the Hebrew and we see some word and, and it's the same word that's used for Messiah, Messiah just means the word anointed. Okay, that's where it comes from. And then, of course, but of course, when we use it in our day and age, Messiah and Christ, we only refer to Jesus Christ. But I'm saying that because I don't want one day one of these preachers to make an accident like that. 
Uh, it says Messiah here in the, in the Hebrew, and that's about Christ when it's not even about Christ or something like that, okay? Anyway, I just thought that was interesting because what really, I'm trying, I'm trying to figure out who could be the anointed that's mentioned here. It could be Christ, still could be Christ. I'm not saying that it's not Christ. Again, it could be King David himself. But there's another interesting passage in the New Testament. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 21. And actually, this is the one that I believe it's referring to, the third one, okay? I can't be 100% correct. Could be David, could be Jesus, but I believe it's the third one here. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, it says, Now he which establishes us with you in Christ and have anointed us is God. You know, we've all been anointed by God. We've all had that anointing. Verse number 22, it says, Who have sealed us, and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. That anointing is the Holy Spirit. Okay? God has anointed us. The word anointed basically means to be set apart for specific tasks. And we know that Christ was set apart for specific tasks to die for us, to be that punishment. But I want you to notice that ourselves, God refers to us also, that are in Christ Jesus as those that are anointed as well. So when we go back to Psalm 28... And we see the Lord is their strength. David's speaking about a different group, a larger group. Okay. Then he says, and he is the saving strength of his anointed. I do believe that the anointed there are the people that he's referring to, the larger populace that believe on the Lord God. Okay, look at verse number nine. Verse number nine. It ends with this. Save thy people and bless thine inheritance. Feed them also and lift them up forever. There are four amazing things that we as Christians can take from this passage. Number one, save thy people. Now, if you're saved, you're not going to hell. You've already been saved. Your soul has already been saved. So when it says save thy people, it's referring to those that are already saved. But one of the benefits as someone that is saved is that God can save us in our difficulties that we face in our flesh. Just the, just the regular trials and difficulties that we go through life, You know, if you've had some of those in the past and you've gotten past those things, you know, you were delivered out of those difficulties, you can say that God has saved me even in this physical life that I have. It's a great blessing from God to save us in times of difficulties. What else was there? And bless thine inheritance. We are that inheritance, brethren. We can experience the blessings of God. You know, to to bless, I'll just read it to you in Psalm 67 verse 1. It says, God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. I like that. I like the, I, I, I want God's face to shine in my life. I, I want God's shining. I, I, I want that light. I want to be in God's presence because we know that God is light. In him, there's no darkness at all. You know, if God's light is shining upon us, it tells me that we're close with the Lord. We're, we're, we're getting that light of his glory. And that is the blessing. The blessing is that we can live a life knowing that the God of all things is watching for us, looking out for us, you know, looking to bless us in whatever capacity we serve Him in. Then it says this, uh, feed, feed them also. That's a good prayer. You know, we should be praying for that. You know, we have a lot of good preachers here, you know, uh, that are feeding people God's Word. That's, that's a, what a blessing that is. Okay, but it, it's worth praying for. It's worth, Lord, you know, I know brother so-and-so, you know, we've passed the Kevin away down in Sydney. You know, I'm not sure who's preaching this coming Sunday, but, you know, whoever it is, Lord, uh, these men, can you please uh, give them the ability to, to feed your people the word of God? You know, in, in, uh, if you can please turn to, uh, yeah, turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. I'll get you to turn there, yeah. yeah. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 2. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 2. And while you're turning to 1 Peter chapter 5, I'm going to read to you from Acts 20, 28. And I know I, I've, I've, I've preached these passages before, but it's, it's a good reminder anyway. Paul says to some pastors, to some elders, he says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he have purchased with his own blood. So we're called here, pastors are called to feed God's church. What a blessing to have New Life Baptist Church. 
What a blessing to have, even when the past is away, that God's people are still being fed His Word. Remind yourself, our preachers, when you get up to preach, that's your job. You know, I, I am delegating this task to you. You know? you know, God's people need to be fed. You know, they need to learn God's Word. They need to, uh, you know, be full of God's words because they, they got a hard week ahead and, and they're going to be tempted. They're going to be tempted to sin and they're going to be tempted to walk in the flesh and not in the spirit. And, and they're going to be tempted to not pick up the Bibles and, and not to pray. And it's our jobs to feed people God's word so they're ready to, to face the days ahead, at least till the next sermon's ready, okay? Until they hear that, that, those next words of God. So if they remind yourself that, right? It's not just here, I'm getting up and I'm showing my intelligence or something. You're commanded to feed people God's word. Okay? You're in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 2. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. You know, we are blessed because, you know, I, I'm able to now, not at the beginning, you know, but to, to reward those that labor in God's house, you know, and it's not much, but it, it's, a, it's a sign of, of appreciation, you know, that, that I, I give to the men here through the funds that are collected by the church. But notice that the command here is, is, is if we are going to feed God's word, if we are to be pastors, we ought not to do it for filthy lucre, okay? And it saddens me how many people will only serve a church or will only get into the ministry because they need to get paid. They're doing it for the lucre. They're doing it for the money. It's, it's, now, that's an important part, okay? And, and, you know, the first 15 months of starting this church was really hard. You know, I, I really hemorrhaged financially because <laughs> okay, I wasn't getting paid. But I, I'm happy, though. I'm so happy that happened, right? Because nobody can turn around and say, Pastor Kevin became a pastor for filthy lucre. That there was no financial benefit. That there was the benefit of the Sunshine Coast. That there was the benefit of, of less traffic. There was the benefit of, of meeting new brethren and, and, and starting something and doing a great work for God. There's the benefit of, of the rewards in heaven, but, you know, it definitely is not for the field for Luke. I, I thank God for that opportunity because, you know, while it was hard, I'm glad I went through that and I realized, you know what, my heart was just to feed people God's word. I want that in your heart as well. I want that for the preachers. And one day, may, maybe God will use you one day. We don't know. At 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years. Moses was 80 years old when he became the pastor in the wilderness. Okay? So we don't know when God may step in and, and, and uh, have a job for you to feed people God's word. But understand, it does require sacrifice. We ought not to do it for filthy lucre. Now, please go to 1 Peter chapter 5. And verse number 5, or oh, you're there, you're, you're in chapter 5. So just drop down to verse number 5. So the, the next point that I wanted to look at in this psalm, because it said, save, verse number 9 said, Save thy people, and bless thy inheritance, feed them also, and it says, and lift them up forever. Lift them up forever. And I just saw this here in verse number 5. It says, Likewise ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. What an amazing thing. Okay, so I think this goes well with the psalm, how it ends. You know what? The, the psalmist, David here, is asking for God to lift up His people. Well, we want, I want to be lifted up. I want you to be lifted up, okay? I want you to be exalted by God, but we need to start with humility, to humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God, to be subject one to another. Say, you come to church, how can I bless brother so-and-so? Sister, we're talking about your cards. That's one way you serve the brethren. Keep it going. I want you to continue doing that. That's your capacity to serve the brethren. We lower ourselves, we humble ourselves, Okay, we have a love for the brethren. We lower ourselves. It's the Lord that will exalt us. Again, in due time. It might not happen when you want it to happen, but it will happen in God's time. Casting all your care upon Him. Again, we end with a prayer there, for He careth for you. So this is how we do it. You know, we don't get bogged down with all the pressures and the difficulties in life. We simply take those cares, we take those burdens, and say, Lord God, please take care of them for me, and please exalt me in your due time. Okay, let's pray.